It's, it's a very special pleasure today to welcome back to the Federalist Society one of our oldest and best friends, C. Boyd and Gray. Boyden has provided us with invaluable help at many of our previous conferences and has participated in numerous Federalist events. Early on, he helped us with an especially impossible assignment when he skillfully moderated a highly animated debate on the First Amendment between Richard Epstein, Justice Scalia, Lino Graglia, and Floyd Abrams. In, in 1987, Boyden helped us organize a conference on foreign affairs in the Constitution that in many ways laid the groundwork for this symposium. His advice and friendship have helped to shape the Federalist Society as an organization, and all of us who've worked to build the society are deeply grateful. We're especially happy to have Boyden as our luncheon speaker at this conference because of his longstanding interest in separation of powers. As counsel to President Reagan's task force on regulatory relief, he became intimately aware of the extent to which the authority of the unitary executive has been fragmented during the last 50 years. Perhaps as a result, he's become one of the most outspoken defenders in recent times of the constitutional arrangements bequeathed to us by the Founding Fathers and more recently undermined. Accordingly, no one was surprised when President Bush asked Boyden to serve as his White House counsel and advise him on separation of powers issues. The President could not have found a better source of advice on those questions. We've observed before at these conferences that one of the many admirable characteristics of the group of men who founded this country was that they combined the life of the mind with the life of action. James Madison, for example, was one of America's most important political philosophers because of his contributions to the Federalist Papers. Yet, at the same time, he was an important participant in the highly political process by which the Constitution was designed, later going on to serve as the nation's fourth president. Our speaker today combines the same love of both ideas and action. Boyd and Gray graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University, was first in his class at the University of North Carolina Law School, and was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. He has served as a law clerk to Chief Justice Earl Warren, as a partner at Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, as counsel to the Vice President, and now as White House counsel. He's also a sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserves. It's a great pleasure to welcome Boyden back to the Federalist Society today. That's very flattering. Thank you very much. I was a sergeant, though. I'm not now one. Um, um, this is a, um, a terrific conference. I'm a little nervous about speaking after so many distinguished speakers um, about uh, whose speeches I've heard some uh, very, very uh, nice remarks. So I have to be, and I don't think I'm really quite up to, uh, and especially if, if one compares uh, my speaking to the to that First Amendment panel, I have a tape of it, and I treasure the the tape. It was one of the most amusing episodes of my life. <laughs> and um, if people really want to be entertained, ask the Federal Society for a, a tape of that First Amendment conference. It was absolutely um, superb. Um, I want to talk uh, about the level playing field. You've heard a lot. Everyone knows what the separation of powers is, is all about. Um, it's, it's designed to limit accumulation of power in government horizontally, verti vertically, horizontally uh, by three branches, vertically uh, by delegating um, or, or not taking much or too much from the states. That's the theory anyway. Casting ambition against ambition. Um, at, at, at the federal level, You've heard about the vortex of the legislature. A quote that I always like is uh, from the same Federalist number 48 is uh, the quote, it is against the enterprising ambition of this department, that is the legislative department, that the people ought to indulge all of their jealousy and exhaust all of their precautions. Um, it is exhausting, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Um, one of the ways that, that the legislative department uh, finds advantage, gains advantage over the other two departments, or at least over the executive branch, 
is to hamstring the executive branch with a whole bunch of restrictions that it doesn't apply to itself. Um, it is our duty to fight these restrictions, um, both to, to perhaps relieve ourselves of the ones that are unreasonable, um, but also to make sure that there is a level playing field. Most of you are probably familiar with the one-way street or the examples of the one-way street, but just let me run over them uh, briefly. There's the whole realm of ethics. We got a little reform uh, at the tail end of the first session of this current Congress, but not very much. Generally, the legislative branch does not have to follow anywhere near um, the level of strictness that, that we have to follow and that I am personally in part responsible for overseeing. When the president in the first week in office had the inspectors general in to encourage them to help keep him and his department heads out of trouble, one of the principal complaints they had was, or observations they had was, that, that the graduates or, or, or um, if you want to call them graduates of the legislative branch who migrated into the executive branch were the most difficult to deal with because they found the culture of, uh, of ethics and conflicts of interest uh, so hard to so hard to follow. <laughs> I am not. I am not. This is. I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm really not making this up. Um, we made a, a modest effort to. To, to, to apply a sliver of our, our exposure under Section 208 of the Criminal Code in, involving conflicts of interest, a sliver of this we wanted to apply to uh, the Congress. It, it was not well received. Uh, we then backed off and said, let's try the staff. Uh, that was not well received either. Uh, one congressman uh, or senator, I won't identify which branch or who, said that uh, any, uh, subjecting any staff to, uh, to any conflict of interest um, criminal exposure would be an unconstitutional infringement on their duty to represent the special interests. <laughs> <clears throat> he said we cannot have U.S. attorneys from the executive branch looking over our shoulder every other month. I said, all the more reason why you should accept our generous offer for an independent counsel <laughs> statute. <laughs> to his favor, it took him about 10 seconds to suppress a laugh. Um, in the ethics package that was passed, there is some exposure for staff and members under the revolving door provisions. Um, and perhaps an easy enough thing to give away since the revolving door really isn't in my view anyway, that much of a, of a problem and shouldn't be regulated, but isn't that hard to comply with. You've heard about the independent counsel, the IGs I mentioned, there are no IGs on the Hill. Uh, FOIA, Government in the Sunshine, the Privacy Act, the Presidential Records Act. You may say, what's the Presidential Records Act? Well, try to keep a diary um, and think it's your own. Try to work it out. I can't tell you how many countless hours I have occupied of myself and my staff and the President trying to figure out how can he keep a record that doesn't belong to someone on the Hill. It's very, very difficult. <laughs> <clears throat> we've had reams of scholars in. We've had libraries. I've been to directors of the Library of Congress. We've had directors of this. We've had directors of that. We still don't have a solution. It has defied every mind um, um, in, in this field. Um, we're working on it, though. We're still working. And if we come up with something, I'll be glad to share it with you. Uh, discrimination, uh, Title VII, uh, the Rehab Act, um, age discrimination. I don't necessarily view these as, as, as restrictions, but they are uh, reflections of, of, of a one-way street. It's interesting that the, that the Americans with Disability Act, which is uh, through the Senate and now pending in the House, will, is, is, is the first statute of this kind to cover Congress. And um, I don't know what that means. It may be a reflection of how good a law the Americans with Disabilities Act is. I don't know. But um, it is the first, like the sliver of the revolving door the first time a Congress has subjected itself to what it subjects to, subjects everybody else to. All right, someone might say, so what? So what's the point of, uh, of, of this one-way street? What's the point? It's just a turf fight. Um, there are questions, of course, about the rule of law. I don't want to go into this because uh, I haven't got time about um, their ignoring a charter, for example, pa continuing to pass statutes that have legislative vetoes and then uh, sort of challenging us to, to, um, uh, to ignore the Supreme Court and follow their, 
uh, statutes. Uh, we have a constitutional obligation, as the former Attorney General sitting here has pointed out uh, vigorously in the 1980s. Uh, the executive branch has an obligation, the President does, to uphold the Constitution just like uh, the courts do. Uh, there is, um, though, uh, several pragmatic examples, which I'd like to go into, which you may have, have heard, just to give you some pragmatic uh, uh, a reflection on this. In foreign policy, you heard a little bit about Panama, the restrictions now you know, facing the President as he tries to uh, uh, provide aid and assistance to the government, economic aid and assistance to the government of Panama. Um, I don't think this is, <clears throat> this is any more classified, but one of the difficulties in the prior administration, uh, one of the difficulties the prior administration had in, in helping uh, the enemies of Noriega was that uh, it, it required so many uh, reviews uh, uh, to get simple communications equipment to Duvalier uh, so many subcommittee sign-offs had to be obtained, you wonder how these could survive amidst charter, that it took a month to unravel it all with the lawyers getting waivers on this and getting assignments on that, that of course a month later it was uh, 29 days too late. Uh, the sad thing about it is is that this equipment that Duvalier wanted uh, could have been bought, uh, can be bought today at your local radio shack. But of course, we couldn't uh, ask another country uh, to provide the Radio Shack equipment, because that would have been wrong. <laughs> um, take farm programs. Um, it, is a, it is a fiction of the agriculture committees that no aspect of any farm program in the United States of America has any impact on the value of farmland. <laughs> this is to permit farmers and those who benefit from the farm programs to run the programs. I once asked Cooper Evans, who is the White House Ag Advisor and a proud owner of some 22,000 acres of soybeans and corn and, and um, uh, cattle, if this may explain why we have so many billions of farm uh, uh, deficit. And he said, Boyden, I can't quarrel with you. If you want me to go back to Iowa, I'll go back to Iowa. And I said, no, the President wants you here, and there's no, pre no reason why you shouldn't be here. And he said, well, I'll stay then. Um, <laughs> The pay is very good, actually. He gets paid more than almost anybody in the White House except for the President himself. Um, it, is, it is, I believe, uh, there is a relationship between the fiction that farmland is not, uh, that, that, that there is no conflict of interest. Um, I think there is a relationship. I don't know. Take a look at the SNL crisis. I could go into a long story about this. I would just urge all of you to read, if you haven't already, Honest Graph uh, by Brooks Jackson that will explain how a handful of members of Congress um, by frustrating efforts by the executive branch to enact legislation to begin the reform process and by intervening in the regulatory process um, uh, g gave us our current crisis. This is a book that was written pre-Keating 5. You don't even have to know about Keating 5 uh, to uh, have your hair uh, curl. Um, take, the, take the Clean Air Act, which we're now working on. Now, people, people, um, worry about the cost of what we propose, to say nothing of the cost of what the Senate bill uh, proposes to do, they tend to forget, of course, the cost of the current law. We have the risk now of judges taking over the running of our major cities. It happened in Phoenix. Luckily, the state got its act together and, uh, and, and implemented its SIP, that's a state implementation plan, for those of you who are not um, aficionados of the Clean Air Act. Um, but uh, it was FIPT, that's, that's called a Federal Implementation Plan. Um, uh, Phoenix was FIPT. Um, <coughs> uh, San Francisco is now being FIPT. <coughs> the judge is uh, going to ban hairsprays and uh, lawnmowers and leaf blowers. Um, Los Angeles may get FIPT soon. Uh, Chicago is on the verge of a FIPT. <coughs> uh, you laugh, but it's, 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 uh, it's quite true. Um, there is really no reason why a judge should be running the affairs of, of, of these cities. We need to reform the law. It's been very difficult to get reform because of the contending special interests that have their baronies. The current economist says that the president has broken the logjam with his bill that balances all of these interests that only a unitary executive can do. Uh, we'll wait and see. The bill hasn't passed yet. 
But I believe it will, and it will pass only because uh, the, the executive took all of these special interests, tried to balance them in a way uh, that uh, uh, could pass uh, the Congress and actually uh, uh, um, benefit the public. Uh, the Congress has not been able to do this now for 12 years, and if the President hadn't taken action, I don't think it would have been able to act for another uh, 12 years. The opportunity uh, that is provided by these uh, statutes to, to raise money, whether it's honoraria or, or, or campaign finance, is just too tempting. It's, it's too tempting, and we must uh, reform it. But one way to reform it is to have the President take the lead uh, with proposals that can cut through um, these issues. A side loser, when you have special interests um, holding such sway, is innovation. I've written about this before, so this will bore some of you who, or any of you who've read it. Uh, but one of the, one of the great uh, grandfathering um, clauses of the current clean air regime is the, is the scrubber. It's one of the most extraordinary uh, um, wastes of the public's money that you can imagine. Um, if our bill goes through, it'll finally uh, allow people with a better idea than a scrubber uh, to compete with it. But the way the current law works, you have to put a scrubber on a new power plant in order to reduce the pollution, the SO2 that comes out of the smokestack. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, this requirement applies even in the West where the, the coal is so low in sulfur that you have to add sulfur to the boiler uh, to make the whole contraption work. <laughs> this is to guarantee markets for the high sulfur Midwestern coal. It doesn't make any sense and hopefully it will go the way of, of a lot of other things. So I, I don't think it's a question of turf. Uh, the President's obligation um, or our, our obligation to fight for the President in his office. It's a question of, of an end in itself that is important. The office, the office of the Presidency um, is, some people say in a colloquial way, is too expensive to be bought by any industry or interest group. It's just too steep. The price is too steep. You can get a congressman, you can get a staffer, you might get a subcommittee, you might get a whole committee, but the White House is just too steep. That's just, that's just another way of putting uh, that, that the President is elected to represent the public interest, the whole interest, and not the special interest. The special interest should be represented, they just shouldn't dominate in all cases. And it's not just a turf fight, it isn't just a question of fun and games, it is designed to allow the public interest to be vindicated. In the end, when you have a Congress that is overrun with special interest, you have a fragmentation uh, that gets out of hand, committees, subcommittees, there are 85 committees and subcommittees in foreign policy. The President's finally talking about the 535 Secretaries of State, but you cannot have a coherent foreign policy when you have 85 subcommittees all with a hand in it, who don't talk to each other, I might add. Um, one judge can hold up judicial appointments. Um, one, one senator called me up who's on the Energy Committee. Back last June said, you're not doing enough on global warming. I said, but we're trying, having trouble integrating the agriculture side of it, the forestry, the the, the, the rainforest, our own forests, our own agriculture into the industrial side of it. Difficult guy to get the agriculture department in with EPA and the Department of Energy. He said, well, that's irrelevant. I said, what's irrelevant? He said, agriculture's irrelevant. I said, why? He said, different committee, different committee. <laughs> the budget, the budget. The budget's in trouble in part, and Alice Ribbon will tell you this. This isn't mean. In trouble in part because uh, they've separated out long ago the functions of raising money and the functions of spending money. If you don't have to raise the money you spend, you don't worry about it. Um, but even those who have to raise them, uh, who have to, uh, um, to authorize or appropriate the spending, they're split into separate committees too. Uh, the, the purpose of this, of course, uh, is partly to, to hide accountability, I think, uh, but it's also to expand the, the opportunity of individuals to to raise uh, money and get exposure and, and therefore get reelected. There's an old joke which you've heard many times, many of you, if you run into a congressman or a senator and you for some reason draw a blank, he's new, first term, can't remember his name or her name, 
it's always the safest thing to do to, to address him or her as Mr. Chairman because you're, you're likely to be you're likely to be uh, you're likely to be right now. Stopping legislation with one person, the way the Senate rules operate, almost one person can put a hold on almost anything. Stopping legislation may not be mischievous. There are many of you who might think, gee whiz, that's not a bad idea. Good way to, uh, uh, to stop the vortex from, from uh, uh, doing damage. The trouble is, is that it also stops undoing damage that's been done previously. Um, but more importantly, much of the damage that's done by the congressional side of it is done through micromanagement of the executive branch. Uh, you've heard discussion yesterday, I'm told, about executive review, a White House review of, uh, of uh, regulations. Committees will go in and grab after, or staff will go in and grab after uh, a, um, a regulatory agency or a part of it. Uh, the only way any sense can be lent in, in all of this is to have the, the White House bring all the departments in to do the talking that the fragmented committees uh, won't do. We have a drug czar in large part because there is no, there is no coordinating committee in the Congress. The President has taken his obligation in foreign policy to consult with Congress very, very carefully. It is interesting, I think, and I believe this to be the case, that, that the members of the competing committees with a role in foreign policy, armed services, foreign relations, Senate intelligence or House intelligence, armed services, that these, that the, and, and, and finance in, in terms of international trade, I would wager that they get together and discuss these issues more often in the, in the cabinet room than they do in Congress. The President can do this. The Congress is not doing it. Uh, the Presidency has an obligation you know, to do it. And on that note, um, I will close. The part of the problem is a very simple one. I grew up in the South. People have heard me say this. Uh, God bless the man who sues my client. <clears throat> <laughs> Creating problems in the Congress is great because it helps you get invited to places, helps you with honorary. This is marvelous anecdote of Simpson. Uh, he, he said this in the congressional record of how he went out to a <clears throat> junket and was waiting around, having asked to give, you know, when am I going to give my speech, lunch passed, dinner passed, no one asked him to give a speech. He finally, the next morning, said, walked into the empty ballroom and said, I want to give my speech. And they said, oh, come on, Senator Simpson, go out and ski a little bit, play a little tennis, swim. I mean, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. He said, I want to give a speech. I want a platform. I want to give a speech. He made him pull in the lectern, and he gave a speech to an empty hall. Um, the opportunities for all of this, whether it's to raise money for campaigns, to get invited on trips, it might, there might be less opportunities if you, if you engage in less mischief. Again, God bless the man who sues my client. One lawyer in a small town won't do very well, but two lawyers will do very well indeed. <laughs> um, lead us not into temptation. The executive branch has a duty to resist the temptation. Um, thank you very much.